When I was living here in the Netherlands, I met a Yazidi man who was telling me about the story of the genocide against Yazidi. This man, in one of the attacks that Saddam Sirajim attacked his village, he lost all his children, he lost his wife. So he remains alone and he was coming to the Netherlands. Then I had the same story. The people the, in the area that I am living in, Halabja, in Germian, and all this around, we are facing genocide. We are surviving from genocide. So we had a common issue. We have a common story to talk about the genocide that faced our people in different areas in, in Kurdistan and in Iraq. When I went back in 2010 to, the, to Kurdistan, so the story of the man was in my mind, because even when I was, I, I have a political background from the opposition family, but I didn't hear so many about the Yazidi issue that the Yazidi caused. So then it encouraged me when I went back to search for the issue of Yazidi, to visit their area, to ask people, to ask them about the situation. I found that it is one of the most vulnerable group in Iraq. The, 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 the community were targeted in the long history always by all people, all authorities who run Iraq in the last hundreds of thousands of years ago. So when, when we found Emma with my, my friend, my colleague, Dr. Ben, she's also a psychiatrist, she was also in the Netherlands. So we decided actually to focus on the Yazidi issue, on the to empowering Yazidi women. We did assessment and we see what they need, what's the need there. And we had a plan. But unfortunately, before we start, before we do any action, ISIS came and ISIS controlled the whole area of Yazidi. And they committed genocide. More than 400,000 people displaced from the, their places. More than 3,000 women captured and used as a sex slave and raped and sold several times in their, during their captivity. More than around 4,000 men and young boys, nobody knows about them. Now we hear, we see that, found them in the mass graphs that opened now in the, in the, last, in the last years. Uh, now, it was really, uh, for us as a woman organization, as a feminist organization, Okay, we left all the empowerment of men. We have to have a, a reaction for the for the situation. There are thousands of people living on the street. They don't have any food. They don't have any clothes to to wear, anything to have. So then we decided to 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 provide relief to them: food, drink, water, women needs, children, milk for children. So one day we went to one of the of the area, there were a thousands of Yazidi were there on the street, and it was a hall, like smaller, smaller than this hall that we are here. More than, I think, 200, 300 maybe women and all men and children were there. So we had some clothes to distribute to the to women. So when we went to one old woman, she was very old, she had clothes, was very dirty. So we gave her a cloth, she refused to take. She said, no, it is not my clothes. This white long dress is what, the one that I want to, to wear. I asked her, okay, where we can find to buy to? She said, no, it is handmade. I, I make it. For us, it was like to understand, it's not about clothes, it's about identity. Her long dress, it is her identity. If you force her to wear any other colors, any other clothes, it means that we also harm them. So we have to do something for that, to protect their identity through the, through the clothes that she likes to wear. And then at that time, we just found it less than one year. We don't have staff, we don't have so many people, we don't have funds. And we are asking the people around us what we do. We found a Syrian woman who we were supported her before. She said, I can make clothes. I will do, I have to do. I came to Kurdistan, Kurdish people helped me. And now I have to help Yazidi people. So she made with the other women thousands of this long white clothes and we distributed in the camps. So that was, we started with them and then the, the time is continue, the time is continue, and the situation as it is the same. So we realized, no, 
it is not such relief also not enough. We need to rehabilitate the people. We need to have a program to rebuild their lives to trauma healing of the of the programs. And then after that, we we would the several supporters, found donors and other, we could provide um, psychosocial support through the centers that we have. We have several centers providing psychosocial support and providing training, um, capacity building, empowering for the SED survivors. And now after five years, we are, if I'm talking about after five years, what we are doing with the situation, as Leila mentioned, as Kajin mentioned, still those people are living under the tent. The same tent that when UNHCR basic building, they said that it's just the quality is just for two years. And now it is five years, most of them still living under this tent. <coughs> It is cold, it is in the winter, it is snowing, raining, and in the uh, in, in summer, it is hot, it's like oven, sometimes above 50 grade. So imagine how people can done. And then a lot of women who were captured by ISIS, now they, they, they could, they managed to come back to escape from ISIS, and especially after the ISIS is over in Syria and, and in Mosul and in Iraq, so they came back. So when they arrived, more traumatized, because they had the hope. When they were by ISIS, they had the wish, they had the hope. When they came back, when they come back, they see their family, they see their relatives, they have a better better life. But there isn't a better life. They are in this tent, in this horrible situation. And when every every few months, when one of the mass graphs open, they are disappointed to see their husband, brothers, sisters, any people that they thought that may they live, they are disappointed there, actually. So one time, I just want to share some some idea or some, some story with you for, the, for, for those women. So when, uh, one time we went to the, uh, it was summer, uh, sorry, it was winter, it was December in 2017. We had a group of the women survivors by ISIS. We went to one of the attractions of Play Park in Arbil. It was very cold and they didn't wear uh, like uh, uh, winter clothes. We went to the shop and we bought uh, clothes to them. A young lady, she was maybe 15, 14 years, she was very happy. I asked her if she's satisfied with her clothes. She said, yes, but not only because I like my clothes. Because the first time after three years, I can wear a new cloth. I can choose. Otherwise, I always forced to wear uh, secondhand clothes. And just I have no other choice to do it. Now, what we do after five years? Again, talking about after five years, many women came back. They are disappointed. There are hundreds of children born because of rape, and the community. Leila, she doesn't want to talk about it, to answer that, because the community are refused those children. According to the Yazidi community, the Yazidi religion, the Yazidi people should be born from Yazidi parents, and those children are born from the Muslim father, so are not accepted by the Yazidi community. And also the Iraqi law are not taking any consideration to such an issue, because according to Iraqi laws, children who their father are not now and they are Muslim automatically. Now, but it is not one child, two, there are hundreds of the children. And imagine how the mothers are feeling when they don't want, they can't keep their children. So really, and there are also hundreds of the young boys brainwashed by ISIS, radicalized by ISIS, and nobody, nobody encouraged to work with them, to support to them. So now, and then, what we do? What's the next steps? Is it community, the peaceful minority like Yazidi, still waiting for the another genocide? So on 3rd of um, August 2014 was 40, uh, 74th time that Yazidi people genocided, committed genocide against them. So and then, should they wait for the another one? So there is no any 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 answer. There is no guarantee. So I'm 
I'm asking us, maybe myself, you, politician, international community, what's the guarantee? Who can guarantee that this is a genocide not happen again? Who can guarantee that these people who are leaving the country stay? Because it's a very well planned, it seems to be. There is no more Jewish. It, Iraq and Kurdistan, it was famous as a uh, diversity area. It was Jewish people, Christian, Shabbat, so many, many, many diversity and minorities there. Now, there is no one Jewish in Iraq. There are from 1,500,000 Christian in 2003 now, still less than 250,000 remains. And Yazidi, where more than a million, it is less than maybe 400, because they are daily living. And then what's the end? That's my question. Till when? How? You know, so that is my question. Hope we all together can, can, can do something, can continue keeping talking about justice, bringing this people, ISIS and the other, other people who committed genocide to the justice. Otherwise, people continue doing that if we become silent. Because as Leila mentioned that till now, other countries, not only Iraq, treating ISIS as a, as a terror, not about genocide. So nobody asked the ISIS fighter when they arrested them, when they raped women. There is no question about that. They are just thinking about the security, national security. Isn't rape? Isn't sexual violence against women not national security? So we need to, I think, all together, we need to, to continue talking, to continue <coughs> calling for bringing justice to Yazidi people. Thank you so much.